on Sting Soft and Gentle works hard, even when you play rough. Clover have asked me to sort out some confusion. They think I'm good at that. Now, you might expect to find clover wrapped like butter because it's churned with cream, but they've added vegetable oil so it spreads from the fridge. So, what's the problem? <laughs> they put it in a tub. <laughs> you see, some people don't think things in tubs taste like butter. So, to stop any confusion, clover has a real buttery taste even though it's in a tub. <laughs> I'm glad that's sorted out. Clover from Dairy Crest Foods. It's what butter lovers have been waiting for. Yes? I'd like something, um... Big, um, huge, ginormous. Something different. Different, uh, taste, different box, uh, different shop. <laughs> no, I think different. Exciting centres. Ah, Lion's made favourite centres. Peanut cluster, there's more. Mint crisp, toffee crumble, triple chalk. A refreshing change. I'll take the box. <laughs> Lion's made favourite centres. Tomorrow, in Heat 2 of The Krypton Factor, the challenge for the superperson of 1985 introduces Andrew Nash, a social worker from Peterborough, Terry Stamp, a systems analyst from Bradford, Michael Hartley, a housing assistant from Liverpool, and Avril Carr, a travel consultant from London. How will she fare against the physical demands of the assault course? And who will succeed in the tests of mental dexterity? Find out in The Krypton Factor, tomorrow at 7 on ITV. And on ITV at the moment, Jimmy Tarbuck with Winner Takes All. Here on 4 now, the story of a unique experience at sea, recalled in Transatlantic Diary. Like the ghosts of a bygone era, the world's square-rigged sailing vessels, known as the Tor ships, never fail to stir the emotions and grip the imagination. Their hypnotic majesty is an echo of a time when the world was still very big and largely unexplored. Today, the Tor ships congregate every two years to form the historic backdrop to a series of ocean races which challenge the courage and endurance of young people in sail training organizations from around the world. For each of those young people, the lessons learned in crossing the Atlantic go far beyond simply developing the time-worn skills of ocean sailing. For each, it's a test not only of their ability to get on with each other in the face of adversity, but also of their ability to get on with themselves. This is the diary of the transatlantic adventures of one of the vessels in the tall ship's race, the 75-foot catch Donald Searle. July 29, Robert Hurst. Dear Diary, well we've done it. Three hours ago, we crossed the finish line at the transatlantic tall ships race. And after 17 days at sea, boy do I need a bath. Actually, we all do. There have been a few occasions when we've all wondered whether we'd make it at all. What was everything going wrong? And certainly this time last week, no one would have predicted the eventual outcome. We'll be in Liverpool tomorrow the end of a voyage that actually started over four months ago. For most of the crew of the Donald Searle, it was a cold spring weekend at the London Sailing Project's mooring in Southampton, which marked the beginning of their trip together across the Atlantic. For each of them, it was an opportunity to get to know the boat and each other, since away from the Donald Searle, their lifestyles and backgrounds are about as varied as it's possible to be. Some are still at school, some are in work, some are at university, some are on the dole. Norman Sawyer, skipper of the Donald Searle, explains the objectives of the project. The London Sailing Project 
started using sailing as a medium, that's all it is, just to take boys away from their normal warm life, take them out to sea in a boat, and make life a bit hard for them, and make it uncomfortable and wet and damp. There is the boy who comes from a fairly rough, tough background, who copes well with the rough, tough bits, but then he will often have difficulty, say, with the working with other people, because being rough and tough, he's a, a, a single person. He's usually on his own in his rough, tough world, and therefore finds working with other people somewhat difficult. The other alternative is the, the, the better, easier background boy who comes along, who perhaps just find the whole rough, tough environment somewhat difficult, and that's a problem for him. So it's a mixture, and we get all sorts, and we purposely mix the crew from all ranges of boys from an easy background to those from a difficult background in some of the more rough areas of London, and that's what we're aiming to do. That the zip works. <laughs> Hard on the heels of this light-hearted weekend, however, a chill reminder of the sea's unforgiving nature came with the tragic news of the disappearance of the Marquise and her crew. They say the Marquise was hit by a freak gust of wind and her bows went under. People were swept overboard or trapped below deck and she went down in less than a minute. Tonight, hopes of finding the 18 people still missing are fading. The Marquise uh, I just can't believe it that uh, something, a ship that had been sailing for so long, so seaworthy, had just been blown over. Um, that was mostly what hit me at first. I think, as Philip says, it's just something you really don't think about. It may happen, but it doesn't happen that often. And it, I think it just acts as a reminder. It makes you that much more careful. Can I ten points of uh, success, please? Yeah. With only a few weeks to go, and the Marquet's disaster receding in everyone's mind, attention turned to the details of their coming voyage. Can I call you a vaguely to order? Say hello. hello. Welcome to the ladies. Nice to see you. It's, uh, we've had a few apologies from people. Roger Pearson coming. Sam Woolen is not coming because he's shifting five tons of so topsoil. <laughs> okay. As you know, I'm not going to be there for the first bit. Pressure of work and all those excitements. Rubbish, <laughs> rubbish, rubbish. Hugh Rickard. You've got a holiday. You've got a holiday. <laughs> yeah, I, I need the rest. Hugh's going to be skipper down from Quebec down to Sydney with Peter as second in command. I'll fly out to Sydney and uh, join you for my little holiday sailing back. Um, I think now I'll hand over to Peter to get on with his bits, which is going to be a bit lengthy because he's got lots of detail to get over to you. Questions come at the end, <laughs> and then you may want to make notes, and then we'll give you some paper if you haven't got, got that. Right, off you go, sport. Right, uh, I think we'll start with the travel arrangements. Now, I have here a ticket which says from Victoria to Amsterdam for six adults and 14 children. <laughs> Midnight, GMT. 6 p.m. local time, Quebec, June the 28th, Sam Woolen. At last, after 30 hours of bus, then train, then taxi, then bus, then ferry, then bus, then plane, then another bus, the six adults and 14 kids have made it to Quebec. Reminds me of Bex Hill. The old girl's looking great, and since she's now home for the next six weeks or so, we're all looking forward to brewing up a cuppa. Once we stowed our kit in the three cubic inches we all seem to have been allocated. Hugh is skipper temporarily, and he's called a briefing to give us a few do's and don'ts. Right, my priorities basically are to get this boat ready to go to sea. So that's the way we've got to start thinking. I know you're an exciting new port, lots of things to do, but you've got to think boat first, fun second. One thing you must use your time alongside to do is to make sure that every single one of you knows where every hull opening is, and where the cock is to turn it off, all right? These sort of boats have <coughs> sunk on races like this before simply because water's been gushing in and nobody knows how to turn it off. It's just a simple matter of turning off a brass valve, okay? So that must be part of your familiarization routine. For tonight, all right, I want to make sure that every man is issued 
the safety harness, life jackets. And the other thing that's got to happen tonight is that everybody must familiarise themselves and watch officers are to check that you have with the man overboard apparatus. Funny you say, why in a harbour? Because people are going to come back and not necessarily our crew are going to come back later on tonight. They might be a bit happy, might be a bit careless. Fall overboard in this harbour on a dark night with too many wets inside you, you'll sink even quicker than you would out at sea. So you must know and have briefed yourself on the man overboard safety gear that's already in place. <coughs> June the 29th, Adrian Atrell. Fortunately, and despite the skipper's dire warnings, no one did fall overboard. Mind you, it was only the more energetic of the crew who went ashore at all, since almost everyone was exhausted from the trip. After a good night's kip, we woke still suffering from jet lag, but keen to get on with the job of settling in. White Watch spent the morning with Chris Webster, who's the purser, cataloguing and storing food. It seems to be hidden away in the most unlikely places. There were even some cans of beans in the heads. Seems appropriate somehow. I can't think we're actually going to eat all this. We could sail to Sydney, Australia, rather than Sydney, Nova Scotia, with the amount we've got on board. But Chris is convinced it'll all come in handy. Red Watch are on shore leave, lucky blighters, and have gone to see the sights. Quebec Marina, June 29th. Robert Hurst. Sam thinks Quebec looks like Bexhill. I think it looks like South End. Earlier today, we were lucky enough to visit some of the tall ships. The most impressive one is the Russian square rigger, Krusenstern. After an official reception from the first officer, who spoke no English at all, we were introduced to the wacky character called Igor. Bonjour. Good afternoon. Здравствуйте. Let me introduce myself. My name is Igor. Uh, we give you a short excursion on board of our ship. Any questions to me? No, no. not yet. No. Okay. <laughs> we study at the Kaliningrad High Engineering Marine College. Our future profession is navigators. Uh, and now, let's start our short excursion. Let's go on. I think Igor, pronounced Igor, thought he was speaking English, and no one really had the heart to disillusion him. It's a massive vessel, and it seemed to us that it was packed with sombre-looking Russians, and we couldn't help comparing this huge ship with our tiny boat. Crossing the Atlantic in the Crucian stern must be a picnic compared to crossing it in dear old Donald Sol. Midday soon came, though, and we headed back for our turn on watch. During the watch, Steve Staples, the ship's engineer and medic, had his briefing on how to repair injured human beings. Right, uh, well, this is the first aid kit, obviously, you know, for uh, a ship, you've got to have one for the uh, injuries on board. And uh, possibly, you know, the most serious injuries you'll probably have to deal with would be uh, breakages, you know, like your uh, arms, legs. So what we've got here is your uh, inflatable splints. Um, Obviously, for the most serious uh, injuries, which will probably be uh, your breakages, but if you've got anything more serious, uh, like uh, amputations or anything, you'll have to give them something like a painkiller, and these are uh, morphine, uh, just for the stopgap you know, between getting them onto a, uh, an escort vessel again. Um, obviously, we hope anything like this doesn't happen, but you've got to be ready for it. B. Oh. Oh, I. Really? I. Hey. Yes? Fear? St. Lawrence, June the 30th, Sam Woolen. With the thought of Steve Staples performing amputations still rattling round our minds, today finds us practicing semaphore for the prey to sail. R is very easy. U and N. Certainly. When you, when you take that basic sketch. R. U. That, that is a U. N is an N when you look at the hands. It's one of Hugh Rickard's bright ideas to impress the Canadians with a spirited rendition of Law Britannia. It'll impress me too if we can get it sorted out. Blue watch leader Roger Pierce is pretending to be on top of the situation. Me, I'm not so sure. More practice is needed. Okay. 
June 30th, Robert Hurst. We're all in our number ones and preparing ourselves for the parade. Not sure everyone understands this 7-4 idea, but I don't suppose anyone I'm sure in Quebec will know what we're doing anyway. Right, gentlemen, from now on in, all right, what matters is the impression the boat gives to the outside world. We start off with hoisting sails. When the command to hoist the sail is given, I want all those sails to go up like grease lightning simultaneously, all right, absolutely together. And after that, keep listening for my voice or the mate's voice and do everything you're asked to do like at the double rush, okay? Really got to switch on from now on. There'll be long periods of nothing happening and then suddenly frantic activity. So keep yourself mentally attuned for that. You get all that aft. Okay, you ready, Peter? Yes. Hoist sails! At last, after so many weeks and months of preparation, the time had come to coax the Donald Searle into life. Running before the light breeze of a bright Quebec afternoon, conditions were ideal for the parade of sail. As the Donald Searle left the ceremonial pageant behind that evening, the crew began to get down to the real purpose of this part of their voyage, namely, familiarizing themselves with the topping lifts and lazy guys, the kicking straps, the upholds and the downhauls that would be the tools they would eventually use to travel the 3,000 miles across the Atlantic. St. Lawrence, July 1st, Age of Natural. A new day has dawned. Since breakfast, we've been playing with the spinnaker, struggling to get it under control. nearly up now, but the pole linkages have jammed against the mast. This is not good news. I suppose someone's going to have to tell the skipper. When we do tell him, and after all the trouble it's taken to get a bloody thing up, 
I have a horrible feeling we're going to have to take the whole shooting match down again. Jaws, Tristan. Fantastic. The whole box. Oh, that's rather nasty. This is, this is not good news. OK, thanks all. Complete change of plan. Right. Well, Janawa hoisted. Let's spinnaker it down. No. But I want that. In that order, Genoa hoisted, spinnaker down. In that order. The spinnaker is a type of sail which, unlike most others, flies free at the mast ahead of the boat, rather like a huge kite. It can boost a yacht's speed significantly, but because of its size, it's also difficult for an inexperienced crew to control. And on this blustery first morning of real sailing, inexperience was all too evident. Things did go wrong this morning. Some of the mistakes were mine, some were yours, some mistakes were caused by lack of knowledge, some by lack of forethought. Okay, so let's just go through it. And it's not a post mortem in trying to point blame at any one person or any one particular thing. It's just post mortem designed and trying to make sure that we get it right next time. Okay, because we're going to have to do this lots of times. July 1st, Robert Hurst. Skipper's holding a post mortem about the morning's fun and games. And we're all beginning to realise that however straightforward the theory might be, putting it into practice is far from simple. Hoist the topping lift, swing the spinnaker pole out, yep, and attach the inboard end of the two guys to what will become the tack of the spinnaker. Attach the spinnaker sheets to the clue of the spinnaker and making sure that you've read the spinnaker halyard outside the foresail and in underneath the foresail. Yep, we think you're looking possible. Puzzled? Okay. Yes. Any In need of more practice? Yes. But are we getting the right kind of wind? Yep. No. We were all looking forward to a fast passage down the St. Lawrence, but someone's nicked the breeze. Midday, July 2nd, Adrian Natural. Every sail in the book, up, and we're still only doing half a knot. Flat calm, and it feels like it's a million degrees in the shade, but at least lunch was a work of art today. I made it. With nothing to do but scrub the decks, we all sit and wait for the winds Hugh has promised will be coming soon. I hope he knows what he's talking about. Hugh is a meteorologist in the Navy, and he finds the weather fascinating. The rest of us find it frustrating. July 3rd, Gulf of St. Lawrence, Robert Hurst. Well, we asked for the wind, and here it is, gusting to a full state gale. The only problem is it's coming from the wrong direction, and so we're having to work hard tacking to get anywhere at all. The boat's are rather jumpy in these conditions. None of us is feeling particularly hungry. I think I'll give lunch a miss. Chris Webster, watch officer extraordinaire, is in charge of things up on the foredeck. He says he refuses to feel seasick. I wish it was that easy. I don't think there is anyone on this boat that now is under any illusions whatsoever about the magnitude of what we are about to undertake. We are about to sail 3,000 miles or so across an ocean. And we are not having a little jaunt down the Solent. We are going to be a self-contained unit by and large. And we have to manage by and large on our own. But at the end of it, even if it is the most miserable three weeks of our lives, you are going to look back and when you get there, those boys are going to say, I've just sailed the Atlantic Ocean. And there are not that many people in the world that can say that. Hard port, half ahead. He's on hard port. Yeah. 6th of July, Friday, Adrian Natural. Approaching Sydney, Nova Scotia at 0300 hours. The place is absolutely deserted, and it's hard to imagine that it'll be soon full of boats and people. On arriving, there are only two sleepy Coast Guard officers to meet us. Apparently, we're two days early. The Ketch Novik, the Square Rigger Gloria, are already in. The others should be here soon. After six days at sea, we're all looking forward to a shower, a hot meal, and, of course, the festivities.
July the 9th, Sydney Harbour, Sam Woolen. The Russians are coming in today. They always cause something of a stir, scattered about the rigging like Christmas tree candles. I wonder which one is Igor. It's nice because there are a lot of familiar faces from the other sold training vessels here in Sydney. Even Andy Freeman, a survivor from the Marquise disaster. What exactly happened? Uh, I was on the poop deck, yeah. uh, just by the wheel. Um, I just noticed the ship was heeling over, and I thought she was just going to stay at that angle, but she didn't. She carried on. Just kept going down. Kept, kept going over to starboard. Um, the mast then went in the water. The bow began to sink. I hung on to the rattlings, which are the, the yeah. rope ladders yeah. that climb up the mast. Um, the water came up to my waist um, and I let go and swam away from the ship. And by the time I had let go and swam away, the ship had gone. Three. How, how long did that take to go down? Less than 45 seconds Less to go down. 45 seconds? Yes. By the time I had let go of the ship and swam maybe 10, 15 feet, she had disappeared. And I was in the water. It was dark and I couldn't see anything. I was just swimming around until I found a piece of wood, which I held onto. Yeah. And then later I found a life rock that had inflated. Yeah. So I climbed into that. You were very lucky. You yes. Very lucky. Yes. A lot of things happened at the right time. time. Yeah. And I was in the right place. At the right time. July 10th, the party, Adrian Atrum. Andy Freeman's story has chilled us all, but we're determined to put all apprehensions about tomorrow's departure firmly to the back of our minds, since it's party time on the Donald Cell. We've given out over 200 invites. I hope they don't all come or we'll sink. Everyone's having a good time, although true to form, it rained a few hours before, but no one seems to mind. The lager is incredibly fizzy, but drinkable. There'll be a few sore heads in the morning. People of Sydney have been wonderful, and we've all made lots of new friends, most of them called Doris. This is Morwellham Quay. Enjoy the bustling boom years of a Victorian riverport, brought so vividly back to life. A full day out with something for all the family. Like the train ride underground, deep into the copper mine. An experience of a lifetime, whatever the weather. Enjoy the splendor of Morwellham Quay, only two miles from Tavistock. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Hello, Pinky. Hello, Inspector. George, pint of Toby for the Inspector, please. Are you drinking Toby? I mean, that's an honest point. Good character, good taste, and good value. Is that it? Trying to make out we haven't got it stashed away somewhere, are we? No, Inspector. Haven't you heard? I'm going straight. <laughs> Shut up. Cheers. Trust Toby. Good, honest bitter. Renault 
five. What's yours called? If an engine could choose its own oil, it couldn't choose a better oil than Duckham's Hypergrade. The engine's choice. The start of a sailing race often appears to be rather chaotic and disorganized, with vessels pointing in nearly every direction, jockeying for position in order that they may catch favorable winds and get a clean start. The chaos can sometimes be real too, and at the start of this transatlantic tour ships race, the Donald Searle has been caught on the hop and is pointing in completely the wrong direction. While other rival boats are at pains to point this out to the crew of the Donald Searle, she's faced with the frustrating prospect of having to sail for a second time round the Coast Guard vessel Nicola before they can officially be considered to have started. Over 3,000 miles and 20 days at sea, it's unlikely to be a significant setback. The effect on morale of a false start like this is easy to imagine. Wednesday, July 11th, Robert Hurst. Well, we're off. We've made a bit of a cock up at the start, but that's that. The lead boats are Canada Maritime, Boo Hiss, Dasher, Sabre, and surprisingly, Cassaro too. I wonder whether they've noticed that their Jolly Roger's missing. We'll give it back to them in Liverpool, after we've won. Unfortunately though, we can't make calls straight for Liverpool, since only the day before yesterday, a high up in the Sail Training Association decided that the whole fleet had first to sail 400 miles south to avoid icebergs. This means the whole route of the race has changed. That is, as Hugh would say, not good news. July 12th, Chris Travis. Today I'm mum and I'm not feeling too good. Imagine cooking for 21 hungry people in a kitchen the size of a cupboard which is pitching around a temperature up to 45 degrees from the vertical. And if you're feeling a bit off colour, well, it isn't easy. But that's what you have to do if you're mum. Mum gets her name from the Mother Watch, a watch whose sole responsibility is to feed and water the ravenous mob. Sometimes I wonder why I come sailing. When I'm feeling like this, I'd rather be almost anywhere else. Oh well, what goes down must come up. Dawn on the third day. After 200 miles of sailing at slightly different speeds and on fractionally differing courses, all of the other vessels in the tall ship's fleet are now completely out of sight of each other. Only the watchful presence of the Canadian Air Force, which has been monitoring their progress and checking for icebergs, reminds the crew of the Donald Searle that a world still exists beyond the horizon and is still interested in their welfare.
It was to be their last contact with humanity before reaching the Coast Guard vessel Jackman. Drifting, apparently in the middle of nowhere, the Jackman represented the southernmost boundary of the iceberg hazard. But getting to that vital turning point proved to be a hard slog against four days of unrelenting headwinds. July 13th, Adrian Atrol. Dear diary, Blue Watch is obviously the most talented watch by far. Our four deck gorillas can do anything, well almost anything. What we can't do is change the wind direction, and that's what we need most right now. We were joined today by a school of dolphins. Maybe they'll bring us luck. For the moment though, it's still pretty rough, and there's a lot of pitching and heaving going on. The boat's doing the pitching, Bob Litton's doing the heaving. Mike the cameraman got a great shot of the event. Sam Woolen, July the 14th. Well, the dolphins worked. We'd nearly reached a turning point and we've got the spinnaker up. The routine continues like a well-old bemonge, but still no sign of icebergs. I begin to think it was all a hoax. Peter Cox is fixing our position and says a jackman should be in sight by this afternoon. Maritime leading, Corsaro two seconds, Dasher third, Sabre fourth, we were fifth. We are approximately nine hours astern of Canada Maritime. And I think we've done quite well. We are not a windward going boat, and we have managed to stay within nine hours of leaders. Good effort on your part. You've done the work, not me. <coughs> this is our winning leg now. We've got 2,100 miles. <laughs> 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 We've done the hard bit, this should be the easy bit. Any questions? How far are we behind Costero 2? About five hours. About an hour behind Sabre. About an hour behind Sabre. So we're within catch with this. We are within catch with all those. We've got 2,000 miles sorted out. July 16th, Robert Hurst. We're in sight of Sabre and overhauling her fast. Catastrophe struck this morning though, the heads got blocked. Steve Staples, Sam and Peter Cox are trying to sort it out. I hope for all their sakes they can. What's the problem here, Peter? <coughs> she has pipe that's blocked. Basically, somebody's stuck too much paper down, not enough liquid. And um, this is the sort of problem it causes on boats. Um, it's actually, although everybody's laughing about it, it's in fact quite a serious problem, as you can imagine. Ready? Take the old people off. One more. Watch your back. Watch your back. Yeah. July 17th, Adrian Atrol. Yesterday it was the heads. Today it was a jammed mainsail halyard block. Yours truly went 80 feet up the mast to unjam it. It's a precarious business, this post and chair lock. You really have to rely on the other four deck gorillas who are hoisting you aloft. It's also very difficult to control when the boat's pitching and rolling. But we cracked it eventually. Blue Watch did it again. July 18th, Sam Woolen. Yet another hiccup in the smooth running of the race. Today the donk, as in donkey generator, has packed up. This is serious since it powers the lights, navigation equipment and the radio. 
Ship surgeon Staples pronounced the condition acute. Fortunately, courtesy of Heath Robinson, he's devised a way of getting it to work using a bungee and a length of tin foil. Progress over the next six days was slow, and the Donald Searle continued to be dogged by problems. Most of them were only mildly irritating, but one of them was potentially devastating. It seemed that the freshwater tank had sprung a leak, and they were still 1,600 miles from home. And as if that worry weren't enough, the next day brought a flat calm and fog. Beset by a faulty radio, a rapidly diminishing gas supply, and the sinister suspicion of a freshwater leak. Being becalmed in a mid-Atlantic fog bank was quite literally the last thing the skipper and crew needed. natural. The highlight of today is washing in freezing cold seawater. Whoopee. You and Norman are desperately straining to glean some comfort from the charts and weather maps, but all that the rest of us can do is sit and wait for a change in our fortunes. I think it's been more of a challenge in these lighter winds than the storm. Um, well, right, we would have been in port now. We would have been probably nearing Hollyhead had it gone to original plans. But then we'd all have plenty of fresh water and all the rest of it, and plenty of food. And now it's, it's down to the crux of the matter, making the food and the water last and keeping the boat sailing all at the same time. So in that case, it's quite an adventure. Before, I think it would just been a, just been a crossing of the Atlantic but now you're getting near survival. The difficulties have been increased slightly in the race, more than we had anticipated at the beginning, because of the planned increase in course length. Right. Well, that's the beginning of the race. Yeah. What's that added to us now? That's added something like uh, 400 miles yeah, to the track, right. which yeah. is about three or four days worth of sailing. Particularly as it happened on the days we had to do that leg, it was against the wind, yeah, it's pretty um, which made a lot difficult of for us. big difference. Yeah. That had a secondary effect in that it brought the starting point of our track across the Atlantic further south, which put us out of the main wind zone at this time of the year. So we've been affected by a lot of light airs, and we're now running days, if not a week or so late. Therefore, I would anticipate we are going to be late in Liverpool beyond the 31st of July. 
I can't say how late because I don't know what's been ruled up seven knots. So that's the story on um, ETA, and I don't know what the answer is. Sorry, could you give us what you, how you do the race now? Do the race? Mm. I said I see us as a uh, fourth position behind the three which are 200 miles ahead. And how catchable? How catchable? Oh, certainly catchable if they fall into a hole in the wind. In the, and they you fall into a dead calm as we fell into. And all the boats... But we've got to make 200 miles up. So they got to fall into a car, we've got to pick 200 miles up. That's right, it's uh, still cheap all, we've got 1,600 miles to go. <laughs> but the days rolled on. And despite a tactical decision to head north in search of stronger winds, the doldrums settled on the Donald Searle and progress was unpredictable. There were good days and there were bad days. The only certainty in their lives was the relentless reality of the four hourly watch routine. July 25th, I think it's Wednesday, Robert Hurst. At about 1100 hours, a terrifying twang reverberated through the ship. Port Spinnaker halyard had gone. Someone had to go up the mast and fix it. Sam was volunteered. As Sam went up, the swell of the sea increased dramatically and a violent pitch threw him bodily into the mast. We could only look on helplessly as this happened again and again. Each time we heard him cry out and then he became unconscious. After getting him down into the cabin, it was found he'd broken a tooth, cut his face, and bruised a number of unmentionable bits of himself. He's a bit dazed, but thank heavens it's not serious. Makes you think, though, even in these light winds, we're all being extra careful. Hugh is now confident, incidentally, that heading north is going to pay off. The winds will definitely come from that way, he says. Let's hope so. fresh water after all. The dolphins have come back, my broken tooth isn't hurting so much, but most of all, the winds are now with us and we're cracking along. At this late stage, we just might make up some of that lost time. Hooray for the meteorologists. July 28, on the dangle, Robert Hurst. The winds are perfect. We've got a full set of sails up and we're really stomping along. This is great news for everyone except Mum, who's fighting to remain upright. In view of our progress, rationing's been lifted and we're getting hot drinks, hot food, sweets, all the comforts of home. Well, nearly all. Dash is only a few miles ahead of us now. We'll catch her during my next watch with any luck.
Those three days and nights of all-out ocean racing enabled the Donald Searle to cover over 500 miles as she galloped towards the finishing line off the south coast of Ireland at an average speed of nine knots. It became clear that she was rapidly overhauling her chief rival, Canada Maritime. But was it rapidly enough? That was the question in everyone's mind as July 29th dawned, the day they were to finish. And now the good news, Adrian Atrell. At 6.02 GMT, we crossed the finishing line of the transatlantic tall ships race, although we still had no idea of how Canada Maritime had done. Um, Lands End Radio, Lands End Radio, this is a yacht Donald Searle from the tall ships race. I crossed the tall ships race finish line on the 29th of July 1984 at 06 hours, 02 minutes, 11 seconds, GMT, over. It wasn't until 10 hundred hours we overheard their skipper talking on the radio. He was very peeved, since he had to admit we'd beaten them by three hours, which meant, incredibly, we were the first and fastest across the Atlantic. The crew can't wait to get to Liverpool now, a bath, a pint and the festivities. It had taken 17 days, 17 hours, and 17 minutes to cover the 3,000 miles from Nova Scotia to the finish. And at last, the Donald Searle had come home. Until this trip, none of the crew, including the officers, had sailed more than a few hundred miles in any single voyage. It had been the opportunity of a lifetime to test themselves against the unrelenting challenge of the sea. Skipper Norman Sawyer. The lessons, emotions and comradeship will remain with these lads all of their lives. They will have learnt of the power of the wind, the need for teamwork in difficult tasks, the feeling of togetherness when facing adversity, and finally, the realisation that with a little more effort and determination, almost anyone can achieve almost anything. That's what the London Sailing Project is all about. And we, in Donald Searle, were just fortunate to be able to do it on a much larger scale than normal. Okay, you're asking 20 odd people, all blokes, to cut themselves off from the world for three weeks. And they've got to live on what food they can take with them, and they can consume two pints of fresh water a day, no more. And the scenery every day is the same flat horizon, and it feels like you're in a car going over one humpbacked bridge after another, again and again. 
and uh, if you've had enough, you can't just take a stroll and get away from it for a while. In fact, you can't get away from it at all. And there are no luxuries. There's no fresh milk, there's no beer, no fridge, no TV, no sliced bread, no bath, no shower, no comfy chairs, no space, no evenings out. And the average person should ask himself, why do these guys do this? I mean, are they crazy? And uh, risking their lives, because it's dangerous. And, um, well, we're not crazy. I don't know, I hope the film provides people with some kind of an answer. Sunday on 4, Amsterdam.